Here's everything you need to know about AWS Lambda as an aspiring software engineer or cloud developer. Let's talk about it. Since I joined Amazon about a year and a half ago, I've been using Lambda almost every single day, whether it was touching code, updating configurations, or solving bugs. So I wanted to make this video to share with you guys some of the most important lessons I've learned and limitations with AWS Lambda that you should probably consider before you start using the service. So first off, what is Lambda? You can think of a Lambda function like any other function. It's a block of code that, given some input, does something and can give you some output. The main difference here is because Lambda functions are stored on the cloud and serverless, they can be invoked from anywhere and it's particularly useful when you're working with other cloud infrastructure. For example, you might have a Lambda function that calls off to another Lambda function, or you might have an API which invokes your Lambda function, or it might be triggered on some event, like somebody uploading something to an S3 bucket. While Lambda functions are great, like all software, they have some significant limitations. I'm going to talk you guys through the most important ones and common workarounds to avoid these pitfalls. Let's start off with the Lambda payload size. Lambda has a fixed output payload size of 6 megabytes. If you're working with Lambda functions to process large amounts of data, or maybe even interact with a database and want to return something to a user, this can become a real bottleneck very quickly. Luckily, you do have a few options here. First and foremost, and probably the best and industry standard way to work around this is by using a pre-signed S3 URL. Instead of directly passing data back to a user when they invoke your function, you can take that data, put it into an S3 bucket, and create a URL. You can then return that URL back to your consumers instead of directly returning the data. The user can then access that data in your S3 bucket via the pre-signed URL and boom, you now have no payload limitations due to S3. Next, let's talk about timeouts. A Lambda function can only run for 15 minutes. That is a hard cap. If you do have a job that's running for longer than 15 minutes, I want you to think long and hard about if Lambda is actually the right tool for you. Lambda is meant for short function invocations, and you can even use it to host microservices, but if you have something that's going to need 15 minutes of processing time, you might want to consider a different solution like EC2 or Fargate. If you do want to stick with Lambda, you can try breaking up your code via something like step functions and invoke multiple Lambdas throughout the workload. Next, let's talk about the compute limitations of Lambda. You can adjust the memory of your Lambda function from 128 megabytes all the way up to 10 gigabytes, which is a pretty flexible window. This can become a problem if you're importing huge huge libraries that take up half your memory space right from the initialization. You can get around this with things like Lambda layers, which allow you to store libraries separately from your main Lambda function. All right, let's get into the real meat and potatoes of this and talk about concurrency and scaling with Lambda. Lambdas scale well horizontally, meaning a new instance of your Lambda can be created each time you need to serve more traffic. However, spinning up a whole new Lambda instance to serve traffic is actually a pretty time-consuming operation. And when this happens, it's called a cold start. Cold starts are totally fine and part of using Lambda, but we do want to work around these as much as we can because they do introduce quite a lot of latency into your requests. Let's say you just opened a new AWS account and you create one Lambda function. By default, you can serve up to 1,000 concurrent requests at any given time. And this is your default total account concurrency. Now, your total account concurrency is shared across all the Lambda functions in your account. So while this is 1,000 by default, if you have 10 Lambda functions running, between all of them, you can only be serving 1,000 concurrent executions. Luckily, we do have finer control over this at a per function level. Each function allows you to control two different things related to this the provision concurrency and the reserved concurrency. The reserved concurrency is very similar to your account concurrency. You're basically saying, hey, out of my account concurrency, I want to take X amount of concurrency and allocate it to this function. So let's say you do have an account with 10 Lambda functions. If you reserve 100 concurrency for each one of those functions, then you can be sure that one function is not going to take all the TPS and starve out your other functions. Now next, let's talk about provision concurrency. So remember how I said that you want to avoid cold starts as much as possible because they introduce latency into your system? Well, provision concurrency is probably the easiest way to avoid cold starts, though it can be very expensive. Provision concurrency is basically the number of lambdas that you always keep warm or alive, meaning that the runtime is already set up, the libraries are ready, and when you invoke the function, all it has to do is execute your code. Here's the downside of this. AWS Lambda is on a pay-as-you-use model, meaning if you don't make any requests to Lambda, well, you don't pay any money, normally. As soon as you introduce provision concurrency into your Lambda, you need to be paying for those lambdas around the clock, and this can get pretty expensive pretty quickly. So you should ask yourself if you're okay with introducing a little more latency into your system and letting your users experience some cold starts, or if you really are focused on low latency and cost isn't too much of an issue, well, provision concurrency could be your solution. Let me know if you guys have any other questions about Lambda and hopefully me or someone else in the comment section will be able to answer them for you. I'm also just starting out this YouTube channel so it'd mean a lot if you would subscribe and let me know what kind of content you want to see next.